to move. Thank you, Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I beg to move that this House is deeply concerned by the ongoing humanitarian crisis facing refugees uh, across the globe, uh, has considered the secondary impacts of COVID-19 on refugees and displaced persons in fragile and low-income states, and calls on the government to provide urgent support to the world's poorest and most vulnerable countries and communities as they deal with the COVID-19 crisis. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am incredibly grateful to the Backbench Business Committee for allocating time for this important debate and to my honourable friend, the, the member for Oldham, East and Saddleworth, for co-sponsoring this debate, as well as to all colleagues across parties who have supported the call for this important debate. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it is that we are interconnected as a global village. We breathe the same air, drink the same water, enjoy a shared humanity that transcends borders. In that spirit, we address in this debate the plight of the world's refugees in the face of coronavirus and call on the government to do more to help. This, not just, this, not just a, this is not just a crisis across Asia, Africa and the Middle East, it's a crisis affecting Europe and for the UK as we have seen the perilous voyages across the English Channel this summer by desperate people and the terrible tragedy of refugees drowning at sea. Desperate people exploited by criminal gangs and failed utterly by the international community. And as the MP for Bethnal Green and Bow, I can claim some connection to the word refugee. It was originally coined by the French Huguenots, fleeing religious persecution after 1685, many of whom came to Spitalfields in my constituency, and who left their mark on the East End streets, architecture and heritage. The East End was home to the thousands of, uh, many thousands of Jewish refugees in the 1880s. Uh, Jewish refugees from Portugal gave us fish and chips, uh, and much else, of course. Um, after 1881, Jews fleeing pogroms in, Russia, uh, in the Russian Empire came to the UK, and again in the 1930s, uh, they fled uh, the Nazis, including my honourable friend uh, who, uh, who escaped in the Kinder transport train, Lord Dubbs, in the other house. We, are, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to him for all that he has done and continues to do fighting for refugee children. Uh, and it's a great shame that our government hasn't taken uh, up the, uh, the um, case, uh, powerful case he makes for refugee children and hosting refugee children. We have accepted refugees from many parts of the world, whether uh, from Eastern Europe, from Uganda, uh, the Ugandan Asians who were uh, expelled by Idi Amin, from refugees in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Somalia, at Iraq, and many other parts of the world fleeing civil war and conflict. And as a nation at our best, we've provided a welcome home, a chance for refugees to succeed. We have benefited, of course, from their contribution to our politics, to our culture, to our economy, uh, and much else, adding new dimensions to our Britishness. Uh, and, of course, the incredible contributions of, uh, uh, of great figures like Karl Marx uh, and many others. And, of course... Um, of course, uh, our business community, you know, uh, the, t the, uh, the heir of the Tesco's family uh, came from my own constituency uh, and so much else uh, across so many fields. Um, but the landing hasn't always been a soft one. There have always been bigots putting up barriers and blaming and stigmatising refugees, but they have been thankfully in a minority. The UK can be proud of its role in welcoming refugees and also making a global contribution to protecting refugees through, for example, the role that Clement Attlee and Ernest Bevan played in founding the United Nations and the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner, Commission for Refugees in the 1950s. And of course, the establishment of DFID under the last Labour government, which sadly this government has abolished in the middle of a global pandemic. And I know the Minister will say it's business as usual despite the merger. I hope that is the, the case in terms of protecting those who are the poorest in the world who need our support. Today, the refugee crisis is on a scale that uh, none of us could have foreseen. Nearly 80 million people, more than the entire British population, have been forced uh, out of their homes by conflict and persecution. And among them, nearly 26 million classed as refugees, uh, over half of them under the age of 18. These children and young people are displaced and uprooted at the most important times of their lives. Uh, there are also millions of stateless people who have been denied nationality and citizenship and access to basic rights such as education, health care and employment and freedom of movement. 
They are often crowded in unsanitary camps, uh, which despite the efforts of the global NGOs and national governments uh, and the international community, uh, have huge issues in terms of access to health care, uh, life expectancy being incredibly low, and infectious disease being widespread. This is even before we could take into account the impact of coronavirus. Over half of Syrian refugee population, the Syrian refugee population, Mr. Deputy Speaker, have been displaced into refugee settlements, camps uh, in Chad, housing, uh, housing uh, Sudanese refugees camps in Tunis the Tunisian-Libyan border, uh, the Kakuma camp in Kenya, one of the largest in the world, camps in the Iraq, in Iraqi Kurdistan, in Jordan, in Yemen, and of course millions, millions of refugees, Syrian refugees, um, being hosted by Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, and many other countries. And one of the biggest camps in the world now is in uh, Bangladesh for the Rohingya uh, people fleeing murderous um, violence uh, and what the UN has described as ethnic cleansing and is currently the subject of an international court of justice case uh, on um, genocide uh, committed by the Myanmar uh, military uh, uh, government military and the Myanmar government. Millions of people are living in that camp in temporary accommodation. Uh, I saw firsthand the impact on people's lives. The vast majority of them are children and women uh, who've experienced unimaginable violence uh, uh, in that genocide committed by the Burmese military, uh, who cannot work, who are traumatized uh, by what has happened, having lost everything, villages, homes burnt down, their, their mothers being raped in front of them, their fathers being murdered, young men in their families being murdered. Those are the testimonies that I heard when I visited those camps in 2018. And of course, the Syrian crisis, we, many of us have seen for many years. Uh, I visited the Bekaa Valley in 2013 at the beginning of the crisis uh, and saw the impact on children uh, in particular, but also uh, men and women of that conflict that continues to uh, persist and the international community has failed to uh, force the Syrian government to end the war. Many have argued, so including the president of the International Rescue Committee, David Miliband, that the camps should be closed down and refugees should be allowed to integrate into communities and allowed to work. Uh, and of course, we need to do more to en enable the right of return for refugees. Uh, and that means much more action by the international community to look at dealing with the root causes of the conflicts that often has led them to be forced out, uh, whether in Syria uh, and, or, or uh, Myanmar and elsewhere. The tragedy is that the huge financial commitment required to host uh, the sudden influx of refugees in, is placed on the shoulders of the countries that are least able to afford it. 84% of the world's refugees are living in developing countries, and seven out of the top 10 developing countries hosting refugees are considered fragile states in the OECD's fragility framework. And whilst many countries suspended their refugee set resettlement schemes due to the coronavirus pandemic, many of these have now resumed. But not here in the UK, Mr Deputy Speaker. The government has also cruelly voted down the Dubs Amendment, which would have guaranteed family reunion rights for unaccompanied children, uh, child refugees, uh, after the EU withdrawal. So I call on the Minister today to think again and work with his colleagues in the Home Office to make this happen. Uh, if there's one way to, tr to pay tribute to the courage and determination of Lord Dubbs, who was a child refugee himself. This would be one way to do it, and I hope the Minister will take that on. The UK has only accepted a small number of refugees and asylum seekers, which amounts to uh, one quarter of a percentage of the UK's total population. Compare that to what some of the poorest countries are doing in hosting hundreds of thousands, if not over a million refugees. And this year, on top of all the problems facing refugees, we've seen the, in the pandemic, the no, the, we, we know that COVID-19 uh, um, uh, COVID thrives in crowded, cramped conditions where people cannot wash their hands frequently uh, and where medical assistance is extremely limited. We know also that the refugee camp, Moira refugee camp on the Greek island of Lesbos is one of the biggest in Europe which desperately needs assistance. CAFOD is warning uh, about the Syrian refugees, refugee camps in Lebanon, uh, saying that the concern for the large refugee population is that social distancing, self-isolation and frequent hand washing are nearly impossible in the communities where many refugees live. This is widespread, whether we look at Syria, whether we look at Lebanon, Bangladesh and elsewhere. 
Uh, and from, from the, so from the Greek islands to Gaza, from Bangladesh to Botswana, the pandemic is set to sweep through the world's refugee camps, and we need to do more to act. The United Nations Secretary General has described the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as a menace to the whole of humanity, and so the whole of humanity must fight back. This is surely the right approach. And in early April, to over 200 members of parliament signed a letter I coordinated to the Prime Minister uh, calling for urgent support. And those calls remain uh, uh, necessary. Our call was for the UK government to support the UN's $2 billion global humanitarian response plan for COVID appeal to scale up the public health uh, response uh, to uh, support uh, those who need help, who are refugees, uh, and also to deliver PPE, to work with the international partners and the World Bank and the IMF to cope with the impact of COVID um, for middle-income countries, uh, and of course to support the UN's, UN General Secretary's call for a global ceasefire, including any UN Security Council resolution for a global ceasefire uh, to de-escalate conflicts in many, uh, many of the parts of the world, which is giving rise to uh, uh, the forced displacement of people. The government has gone some way to provide humanitarian assistance, but we call on the government to do more around these, this particular agenda, around ending conflicts, around uh, holding uh, certain governments to account where they're not doing so, and also working with the international community to provide the, the funding that's much needed. In relation to uh, uh, in relation to the Rohingya crisis, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have campaigned with many colleagues across the House on this issue uh, uh, for many years now. Uh, and so I want to focus on my, my final remarks on the plight of the Rohingya people, who faced, as I said earlier, incomprehensible atrocities, killings, torture, executions, mass deportations, and the raising of villages, women and girls enduring gang rape and other forms of horrific sexual violence. I heard firsthand their testimonies when I went to Rakhine State in 2013, and then in 2017, and then to Cox's Bazaar, where, which hosts a million refugees Myanmar, um, from Myanmar um, who've been persecuted. We have, we have just uh, recently marked the third anniversary of hundreds of thousands who fled to Bangladesh to escape the genocide. But the genocide or violence against the Rohingya in the summer of 27 didn't come out of the blue. Uh, it came out of a culmination of decades of persecution, systematic discrimination, and the denial of citizenship and, and basic human rights. In Myanmar, there have been a, it has been a significant escalation uh, of violence and continues to be. And the UN continues to document uh, violence against uh, children, including killings, uh, maiming, and sexual violence. Uh, and the, killing, the, the, the recent uh, uh, clearance operation was among the worst. There are hundreds of thousands of Muslim, Muslims who live in, uh, in Burma who continue to be vulnerable. And earlier this year, the Gambia lodged a cl claim, a uh, case against Myanmar at the International Court of Justice. Canada and the Netherlands have formally joined the case. And as a pen holder of, uh, uh, of, uh, for, ben, uh, for Burma in the UN Security Council, the UK should follow suit. And I've called the UK government to do this time and again, as have others. Today, I hope the minister will be able to take this on and follow the lead of the Gambia and the Netherlands and Canada and a number of other countries in prevent the prevention of genocide. This particular case is so important because it will prevent the Burmese military from committing atrocities further and risking the lives in their hands once again. That's why it's so important our government supports it. And, uh, and in terms of uh, what we do next, uh, how we provide support to uh, those who, who desperately need our support, I want to draw attention to the calls by former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who has said that the refugee crisis is not a problem in far-off lands that, that rich countries can ignore. There is a growing demand that the UK government, that, the, that, that the governments of the developed world, including our own, sh should shoulder more of the responsibility. It's in our interest. And that means we need to provide funding, of course, and I know that the British government is doing some of that. We need to go further. We need to lead the way, uh, working with the new US administration. We need to act to try and ensure that there's a proper 
global health and economic recovery plan for those countries, because that is what's going to stem, uh, stem the rise in conflict and the increase in refugees and people being forced out of their homes uh, and, and help to reduce conflict. And we need to double funding to the World Bank for emergency aid. We need to provide more support to the International Monetary Fund to help those countries so that they don't end up uh, uh, being desperate and that the, the economic troubles don't cause further conflict and division in those countries, thereby causing um, more people to suffer and end up as refugees. We also, of course, need to do more to tackle climate change, which is going to create more refugees. In countries like Bangladesh, 30 million people are likely to become climate refugees. So there's a great deal that we need to do, Mr Deputy Speaker, going forward. And I, I hope that our government will take a stronger role in the international arena. If global Britain is to mean anything, it means our responsibility to help the poorest in the world, because yeah. it is in our interest to do so. If we don't, then those refugees out of desperation will want to flee, will want to come to the shores of Europe. And then we have seen the shameful experience over recent years where we haven't been able, we haven't been able to respond as generously as some of the poorest countries have. So the way to tackle this problem is to... I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Lady. Thank you, Lady, for giving way and actually to our securing this debate. And does she agree with me? We must do our part in the UK, particularly where, when, uh, as we did just after I was elected in 2015, we've... This House voted to bomb Syria. I didn't vote for that, but nonetheless, a majority of members did. And where we are bombing countries, we need to be taking our responsibilities when people are displaced from those conflicts. Right, that, that many conflicts have been caused because of uh, failures of uh, the international community. And so we bear a responsibility in making sure, whether it's Iraq or Libya uh, uh, or Syria, uh, where we need to act. We need to provide refuge to those who end up being displaced. And also we need to take action at the international level to bring an end to those conflicts that continue to rage. In conclusion, Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, we need our government to take action, as I said, to provide the humanitarian assistance, but also to work hard to, to hold to account those governments who are causing uh, persecution, who are failing to protect their populations, in fact, who are actively responsible for uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide in countries like Myanmar. We also need our government to, to take a stronger role in terms of mobilising support in the international community to provide more assistance to those countries. Refugees are among the most vulnerable in the world. COVID has exposed them to even graver danger to that, uh, that, that, that which they were already in. We must protect them against the virus. We must press the world's government to step up aid programmes to end conflicts, to tackle poverty and prevent the deaths of tens of thousands of displaced peoples around the world. If we are to tackle this pandemic, then in the words of the UN Secretary General, we are only as strong as the weakest. As the weakest. This is not just a matter of humanitarianism. It is also a 